Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Abbas Ali, your orthopedics faculty with Maro. Now, welcome to this INISET main orthopedics recall session. In this video, we'll be recalling the questions that were asked in the INISET exam this May, and we'll try to figure out what were the kind of questions they were asking from the topics that we are already familiar with. And we will not necessarily uh, reframe the exact question because this is a recall based session where the students recall the questions and human beings have a tendency to be biased towards the answer they have been marking on the exam. So nevertheless, we have collected enough information from many students and we assume that the questions that we are sharing have around 90 to 95 percent accuracy um, like how it was there on the exam. But still, if you feel it was not exactly the same, you can write down in the comments and I'll try to help you find the right answer. Now, with that said, uh, let's see what happened here in INIC exam. The questions came from uh, frequently asked relevant high yielding topics nevertheless. And the questions were straightforward. But there were two things. They were either two level questions where they were first asking you uh, the diagnosis or the nerve involved or the pathology involved. And then they were asking you the second level question, either in terms of complication or in terms of management or in terms of the test for that nerve. So it seemed easy from the get go, but uh, they were quite complicated if you pay attention to it. The second thing is the options. The options also were not very straightforward. They were very close. So this is a typical I and I set scenario where the options are very close to the right one and it causes a little confusion among students and you have to take uh, a little bit of risk to mark those options. And let's see how this played out. Also, I would like to tell you that there were a few questions that students thought were from orthopedics but had uh, a few relevance in anatomy or relevance in radiology. So those will be uh, you know, dealt with by colleagues, uh, um, Dr. Mayur sir or uh, Ravi Raj sir. So if you find that I have not covered everything from orthopedics, maybe you will find those relevant questions there as well. With that said, let's look at the first question. So. This is a question where it is asking a 25 year old male had an injury in his arm and presented with symptoms of inability uh, to flex the distal interphalangeal joint of the fourth and fifth digits. He was also not able to hold a piece of paper between his fingers. What is the likely site of injury? And this was the image that was presented to you. And in this image, there were labels A, B, C and D. And the question asked the options A, B, C and D. Right. So we have seen this kind of question quite a few times in INIC exam and also in the NEAT PG exam. So this is again a second level question. The first level is to understand which nerve do you think is injured? The second level is to recall its anatomy and understand where that nerve lies in terms of this reference image. And the third thing is you have to understand which injury to this structure that they have shown you will likely injure the nerve. So let's start with first level. Let's see which nerve they are talking about. So the problem here is the patient is unable to flex the distal interphalangeal joint, distal interphalangeal joint of the finger four and five. So what is finger number four and five? This is finger four and this is finger number five. And the patient is unable to flex the distal interphalangeal joint. Okay, DIP. He's also not able to hold a piece of paper between the fingers. So how do you hold a piece of paper between the fingers? You can hold it like this, but this is talking about something like this. Right. So something like a card test, something like a card test. Now, if you know these two things, you will be able to understand which nerve I'm talking about. So which muscle brings about flexion in the distal interphalangeal joint of these fingers? Right. Flexor digitorum profundus. Excellent. Right. Flexor digitorum profundus. Now, flexor digitorum profundus is innervated by which nerve? Both the median nerve and the alnar right so median nerve supplies these two fingers and ulnar nerve supplies these two fingers so he's talking about fourth and fifth which is supplied by ulnar nerve so patient is unable to flex the dip of finger number four and five which is supplied by ulnar nerve okay this is what he's saying so he's talking about ulnar nerve so we have established that it's ulnar nerve now the question is asking what is the likely site of injury so what is the structure in front of you this is humerus excellent Excellent, right? So this is the articular surface. So this must be the medial side of the humerus. And this is the lateral side of the humerus. This is the head of the humerus. This is the shaft of the humerus. This is the medial epicondyle. And this is the lateral epicondyle. Now, where do you think is the injury on this humerus that will affect the ulnar nerve? So ulnar nerve, right, goes behind the medial epicondyle, somewhere over here. 
So if there is an injury around this area, it will affect the ulnar nerve. So this is labeled as C. So the correct answer should be C and this is C. Did you understand? Right. This is how they have asked this question. Now, some students make a mistake here. They see A, B, C and D and they would go to C and they would mark C and then the answer would be D, which is a wrong and a silly mistake some students make. So, be careful. So, be careful. The option is A because it is showing the answer as C. Okay. So, let's quickly recall the information you should remember about ulnar nerve. When they say inability to flex the DIP of the fourth and fifth digits, they are talking about the ulnar side of the FDP, which is supplied by ulnar nerve. When they say the patient is not able to hold the paper between the fingers or there is clumsiness in the hands, think card test, which is adduction of the fingers performed by palmar interosci, which is supplied by ulnar nerve. Right? So, again, I would like to show you what are the other nerves that can get injured if there is injury to the humerus at various parts. So, if there is injury at this point, okay, which nerve do you think will be affected? Axillary nerve, right. An axillary nerve manifestation would be patient will lose the function of deltoid and teres minor. This is the motor supply and the sensory distribution is this part of the arm, the upper aspect of the arm, on the lateral side, the regimental badge sign, right. What about injury here? The nerve that wraps around the spiral grooves and then comes out anteriorly perforating the lateral intermuscular septum. Yes, the radial nerve. Right, perfect. The radial nerve. Very good. Right, the radial nerve. And the radial nerve, once it goes down, it goes in front of the lateral condyle of the humerus. So, if there is injury of the lateral condyle of the humerus, again, it will be injury to the radial nerve. Allah nerve, you have seen, it's behind the medial condyle. What about the median nerve? The median nerve goes like this. So, supracondylar humerus fracture, supracondylar humerus fracture injures the median nerve. But remember my friends, if they ask you what is the most commonly injured nerve in supracondylar humerus fracture, you should say anterior interosseous nerve more than median nerve. Why anterior interosseous nerve? Because it is a branch of median nerve. But the anterior interosseous nerve branch is given in the forearm, not in the arm. Then why? It is because the anatomical arrangement of the anterior interosseous nerve, which is on the peripheral aspect of the median nerve over here. So, if there is injury to the median nerve, it is usually the anterior interosseous nerve component of the median nerve that is affected before it affects the whole median nerve. Are you following me? So, supracondylar humerus fracture, think of anterior interosseous nerve and median nerve. Medial epicondyle, think ulnar nerve. Lateral condyle, think radial nerve. Spiral guru or shaft of humerus, think radial nerve. Surgical neck of humerus or proximal humerus, think axillary nerve. And finally, the quick review of ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve, what is the sensory distribution? The medial one and a half fingers, right? So, this is the medial one and a half fingers, also known as the musician's nerve. Okay. It supplies the intrinsic muscles of the hand, that is the palmar interosseae and the dorsal interosseae, which bring about the palmar adduction and dorsal abduction of the fingers. It also supplies lumbricals number three and four, which supplies number finger number four and five. The function of the lumbricals is to flex the MCP and extend the PIP and DIP. If there is injury to the ulnar nerve, the lumbricals will lose their function and the antagonistic group of muscles will overpower and cause a deformity. So, if you are unable to flex the MCP and extend the PIP and DIP, what will happen? The MCP will go into extension and the PIP and DIP will go into flexion. This will give you your classical partial clawing of hand. Partial clawing of hand and the splint that you use in partial claw hand is the knuckle bender splint. If there is an ulnar plus median nerve palsy, get complete clawing of hand. Again, the splint used is knuckle bender splint. But in median nerve palsy, what do you get? In median nerve palsy, you get ape hand deformity and you get pointing index, no clawing. So, ulnar plus median, complete claw hand, ulnar nerve, partial claw hand, median nerve, pointing index, bendiction sign and ape hand deformity. What are the other tests? For palmar interosseae, you have the card test where you test for adduction of the fingers. For dorsal interosseae, you test for abduction that is the Igawa test or fanning of fingers. The adductor pollicis, adductor pollicis is a thin arm muscle that is supplied by ulnar nerve whose action is to adduct the thumb and how can you test for it? The book test. Remember the book test, the patient is unable to adduct and the book starts to slip as the examiner starts to pull the book. So, the patient flexes the thumb which is supplied by median nerve and this is known as froment sign. Because of the weakness of adduction, the patient is compensating by the flexion and this is known as froment sign, okay, froment sign. Take it it was straightforward. All you had to do was revise your nerve injuries. Now, moving on to the next question. A 14-year-old male presented with a mushroom-like tumor in the distal femur for the past two years. 
Which of the following features will help the clinician to identify a malignant transformation? There is an X-ray that is given there. So this is a spotter based question. So you need to make a diagnosis on the image without which your theoretical knowledge about this tumor is useless. Right? right. So look at this image. What is it showing you? It's an X-ray. Very good. X-ray of which part of the body? around the knee, right? So this is your femur, this is the tibia and this is the fibula. Now, can you tell me if this is a mature or an immature skeleton? It shows an immature skeleton on the X-ray because you can see the physial plate or the growth plate and also the question is mentioning a 14 year old boy or a male person. Now, there is an abnormal growth over here that looks something like this and it is growing away from the joint or towards the joint. Something that grows away from the joint? Yes, you know this. This is spotter MCQ. This is osteochondroma or exotosis. Osteochondroma or exotosis. What is osteochondroma? It is the most common benign bone tumor, but it's not a true tumor because it is a developmental malformation where the growth plate, instead of growing vertically, grows sideways. So we remember, this is the growth plate and it's supposed to grow like this from epi to meta. But instead of growing towards the meta, it is growing towards the side. Now, as it grows towards the side, the anatomy of the bone is maintained, the medullary cavity is maintained, the cortical surface is maintained, everything is maintained, but it just grows towards the side. Just an aberrant growth, right? That is what it is. Now, as the growth fuses or the growth plate fuses or stops growing when the child hits skeletal maturity, this lesion also stops growing. That is why it is not a true tumor. Which brings me to the next MC. What is the most common true benign bone tumor? The answer is osteoid osteoma and what do you remember about osteoid osteoma that it usually causes night pains in the child in the middle of the limb that is the middle of the thigh or middle of the leg and these night pains are classically relieved by aspirin right right so this is osteochondroma in front of you now once you've identified the image now you have to recall the theory of osteochondroma now let's look at the options the question is asking you what will help the clinician identify the malignant transformation we know that osteochondroma is a benign lesion, right? It rarely becomes malignant, but it does. And if it does become malignant, what are the classical clinical features that help us identify whether this benign osteochondroma has become malignant chondrosarcoma? Remember those three points. What are those three points? Persistence of growth even after skeletal maturity, number one. Number two, heavily calcified cartilaginous cap. And number three, cartilaginous cap thickness more than two centimeters because usually in osteochondroma the cartilaginous cap thickness is less than two centimeter now what is this cartilaginous cap you see over this osteochondroma there is a cartilaginous cap osteo bone chondro cartilaginous oma swelling so osteochondroma so this cartilaginous cap will be there usually it is not visible on x-ray because it is cartilage so clinically it will be large but radiologically it will be small and that is a very important hint Okay, now this cartilaginous cap is usually less than 2 cm. If it is more than 2 cm, it is usually suggestive that it has become malignant. Cartilage is usually not calcified, but if it's heavily calcified, it is usually suggestive that it has become malignant. And osteochondroma should stop growing after skeletal maturity. And if it continues to grow after skeletal maturity, what does it mean? It becomes, it means it has become malignant. So let's look at the options. Initially, growth of the tumor was away from the joint. Now the tumor growth is towards the joint. Is this suggestive of malignant transformation? No. No, it is not. No, it is not. Hyaline cap thickness on MRI is 2 centimeters? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Tumor does not have malignant transformation potential. This is a wrong statement. It does have, although rare, but it does. Tumor is in continuation with the bone marrow cavity of the normal bone. Yes, this is true. This is true. The, the anatomy or the structure of osteochondrum is such that it it matches the architecture of a normal bone. But once it becomes chondrosarcoma, that alignment, that continuity of the architecture gets disturbed. So among all the options, the most appropriate answer that will help you, suggest you, or tell you that this lesion has become chondrosarcoma or has become malignant is this. Hyaline cap thickness on MRI is more than 2 cm. Did you understand? Right. So again, quick review of osteochondroma. Benign bone tumor, but not a true tumor. It's a developmental malformation of the growth plate. It can be sessile or pedunculated. Sessile means it is just a growth without a pedicle. Pedunculated means it has a pedicle and then there is a growth. It grows away from the joint line because I told you that is the direction of the growth of the growth plate. But rarely, it can also grow towards the joint. Rarely, it does happen. It's very, very rare. That is called as Trevor's disease. 
that is called as Trevor's disease and it is not an indication of it becoming malignant. It's just an aberrant osteochondroma. Okay. It's large to feel but small on x-ray. Why? Because of the cartilage in its cap. The cartilage in its cap is usually less than 2 cm. It stops growing after skeletal maturity. And what is the most common site? Around the knee, distal femur or proximal tibia. The architecture matches the normal bone. So this is a CT scan showing you the medullary cavity that matches the medullary cavity and this is the cortex matching the cortex. But if this is disturbed, it suggests that it has become malignant or dangerous. Now, it is usually asymptomatic and grows with the skeleton, but stops with skeletal maturity. And it can cause pain. Now, pain is nothing to be worried about because there is a growth there and it can cause pain. Suppose there is a fracture there. If there is a fracture. As the child was walking, it fractures his osteochondrum. There can be pain. That is a cause of pain. So, pain, nothing to worry about. There can be a nerve compression and that nerve compression can cause pain. So, pain, nothing to worry about. There can be bursitis. It can compress the bursa and it causes pain. Nothing to worry about. So, pain is nothing to be alarmed about in osteochondroma. So, what do you need to worry about? Malignant transformation if the cap is more than 2 cm, if there is heavy calcification or if there is persistence of growth even after skeletal maturity. So, are you understanding? You may have all the knowledge in the world in your theory, but if you are unable to spot the diagnosis, your knowledge becomes useless. Okay? Right. And that is why in our Clinical Plus videos, that is what we have done. We have trained you to make the appropriate diagnosis and then you can start working up. Okay. Now, one more rare entity that you read in osteochondroma is diaphyseal achalasis or hereditary multiple exotosis or multiple osteochondromatosis where a patient has multiple osteochondromas in the body. Right? That is what. So, multiple osteochondromas in the body. Okay. Now, let's look at this question. A 14-year-old girl uh, presents with multiple swellings and multiple brown rashes. She has increased uptake on bone scan over femur, skull and ribs. Biochemical parameters are abnormal. She also has a history of hypothyroidism. Following is her X-ray. Which of the following is the likely diagnosis? A neuroma? A papillary carcinoma thyroid, McEwen Albright syndrome, or Langer hand cell histiocytosis. This is an X-ray, and if you look carefully, this is again a spotter MCQ. Where if you look at this X-ray, you will be able to make the diagnosis. But the examiner is more gracious now. They have given you a few more hints here, right? Uh, so there is a female here, 14 year old. Uh, there is uh, swellings with brown rashes on the skin. The bone scan shows here an uptake in femur, scar and ribs and the patient has a history of hypothyroidism also. So, endocrine abnormality, bony swellings, uptake in the bone, brown rashes on the skin and x-ray suggestive of this deformity in the femur. What do you think is the diagnosis? Right. So, this deformity in the proximal femur, does this ring any bell? This is shepherd's crook deformity. Right? The stick that shepherds use. The shepherd crook deformity. And shepherd crook deformity is seen in fibrous dysplasia. And in fibrous dysplasia, the syndrome that is associated with it is McCune Albright syndrome. Right? So, this is how you work up and come to a diagnosis. So, like I said, paper looked easy. It's not straightforward. The options were a little confusing because it's a multi-level question. So, once you know it's fibrous dysplasia, you need to know that the syndrome associated with fibrous dysplasia is McCune Albright syndrome. Now, how can you say it is fibrous dysplasia and McCune Albright syndrome? First, Shepherd Crook deformity, obvious deformity on the X ray. Second thing, if you recall your McCune Albright syndrome, what is the triad of McCune Albright syndrome? The patient has precocious puberty, means there is an endocrine abnormality, usually hypothyroidism, right? Precocious puberty, right? Number two, pigmentation, cafe oil is spout, the brown rashes that they are talking about. And number three, poly osteotic fibrous dysplasia. So, it's fibrous dysplasia in multiple bones. It's not a tumor that is metastasizing. It's just a lesion that occurs in multiple bones independently, separately. Right? So, it is a poly osteotic fibrous dysplasia. So, these three P's make McCune Albright syndrome and it's a syndrome that is seen in fibrous dysplasia. So, that is the answer here, my friends. Right? So, again, let's recall what is fibrous dysplasia. It's a developmental anomaly where the bone tissue is replaced by fibrous tissue. So, instead of bone, there is fibrous tissue and because of this fibrous tissue, when the patient puts weight on the bone, the bone sta starts to bend and when the proximal femur starts to bend, it gives you the classical shepherd crook deformity. Now, usually, it occurs in the femur. Right? But that is the mono variant of fibrous dysplasia, meaning one bone and one part of the bone is affected. 
but there can be a polyostotic variant also but there can be a polyostotic variant also where multiple bones or multiple parts of the bones are also affected in that case usually it is the maxilla or the skull okay what else do we know we know radiologically there will be a ground glass appearance or hazy appearance with a shepherd crook deformity and there is a sign called rent sign histopathologically on biopsy there is an mcq asked what is the pattern seen it's called chinese letter pattern appearance so your classical shepherd crook deformity that we are talking about now polyostotic fibrous dysplasia it's not a metastasis but it's a, a disease that occurs in multiple parts of the same bone or multiple bones and the patients usually have cafe olive spots in that case and precocious puberty remember monostotic form of fibrous dysplasia is much much more common than polyostotic fibrous dysplasia and polyostotic fibrous dysplasia is more common than mccune albright syndrome so mccune albright syndrome is quite rare and if it usually is affected or if it is usually presenting it usually presents swellings or a fibrous dysplasia in the skull particularly in the maxilla so this is a patient with a polyostotic fibrous dysplasia or mccune albright syndrome with swellings in the maxilla now here is the interesting thing the patient with polyostotic fibrous dysplasia or mccune albright syndrome the multi ostotic or polyostotic involvement of multiple bones usually occurs on the same side of the body usually okay so same side of the face same side of the uh, you know skull uh, ribs skull and same side of the femur now there is one more syndrome associated with polyostotic fibrous dysplasia that is called mazabrot syndrome so polyostotic fibrous dysplasia friends have two important syndromes associated with it one is mccune albright syndrome another is mazabrot syndrome so in mazabrot syndrome the patient also has polyostotic fibrous dysplasia but he has multiple myxomas multiple myxomas so look at this question now a patient came with history of road traffic accident and shaft of femur fracture patient was stabilized after 12 years after 12 hours uh, he developed sudden onset breathlessness confusion and petechial skin rashes over the axilla and chest what is the probable diagnosis now most of you even without looking at the options will be able to make the diagnosis because you know the key words here fat embolism syndrome head injury blunt trauma to the chest or hemorrhagic shock now the key words here is polytrauma patient long bone fracture breathlessness confusion or difficulty breathing confusion petechial rashes over the axilla and the chest what is the probable diagnosis the classical answer the probable diagnosis is fat embolism syndrome isn't it now the usual consensus is that fat embolism syndrome usually occurs after 24 to 48 hours of trauma it, it takes that much time for the fat globules to scape out but the classical triad of fat embolism syndrome is mentioned here where the patient has difficulty breathing confusion means uh, cns uh, symptoms so cardiorespiratory symptoms cns symptoms and cutaneous symptoms that is the petechial rash in the axilla in the chest so that helps us make a diagnosis and more important long bone fracture like femur right now obviously it's not head injury here and it's not blunt trauma to the chest and hemorrhagic shock hemorrhagic shock yes i mean when there is a femur fracture immediate complication will be the blood loss that usually happens that is around 1 to 1.5 liter of blood lost blood is lost but that usually presents immediately or within one to two days but here the patient may not necessarily have your a petechial rashes so the question is trying to direct you towards your fat embolism syndrome remember long bone fracture particularly in adults and patient presents to you with these three symptomologies chest symptoms that is cardiorespiratory symptoms difficulty breathing tachypnea dyspnea cns symptoms like confusion right confusion and cutaneous symptoms as in petechial rashes think of fat embolism syndrome now coming to shaft of femur fracture it is a fracture that is notorious for blood loss 1 to 1.5 liter of blood is lost and fat embolism syndrome although not a very common complication is still a very dreaded complication usually occurs after 24 to 48 hours of fracture and interestingly it is not seen in children reason being the medullary cavity of the long bone children contains uh, the bone marrow rather than the fat which is eventually replaced to a fat in adults to make a diagnosis you need that classical triad where the patient has uh, respiratory symptoms uh, cns symptoms and petechial rashes 
But if you're ever in confusion, you can use a criteria known as GERD's criteria to make the diagnosis, where it has major and minor criteria. Okay. Thrombocytopenia is an interesting thing that you should keep in mind that is seen in patients with fat embolism syndrome. There is one more thing known as GERD tests. GERD test that helps us uh, pick up the fat globules in the, uh, the urine and the blood. How do you prevent fat embolism syndrome from manifesting? Whenever a patient has a long bone fracture, immediately try to immobilize it or stabilize it because the more the movement you have in long bone fracture, the more likely the fat globules will escape out and get into the bloodstream. So we have something known as damage control orthopedics where a patient who has a long bone fracture and is in fat embolism syndrome, you immediately try to stabilize the fracture with an external fixator, send the patient to ICU to be conservatively or symptomatically treated for fat embolism syndrome. And once fat embolism syndrome is treated, then you can go for a definitive care like uh, intramedullary nailing. Now, right now, if a patient has fat embolism syndrome, the best way to treat fat embolism syndrome is just supportive oxygen and intermittent positive pressure ventilation, like put the patient on ventilator and give supportive therapy. So there are a few questions in orthopedics that once you see those keywords, you should be able to make the diagnosis. So what are those keywords? I keep reminding you of this again and again. If there is something known as pain on passive stretch, if they say pain on passive stretch in the question, think of compartment syndrome. If they say massage, if there is a history of massage following a trauma, think of myositis ossificans. If they say long bone or femur fracture, followed by difficulty breathing and petechial rashes, you should think of fat embolism syndrome. Okay, So these are the keywords that help you make a diagnosis. Other than that, the question was straightforward and obvious. Now let's look at this question. A patient has sustained a pelvic fracture in a road traffic accident and is bleeding and is in shock. Immediate management for this case should be immediate internal fixation, immediate external fixation, give blood transfusion, tie a bed sheet around the pelvis. So this is a polytrauma patient with pelvis fracture. Now you know pelvis fracture is notorious for blood loss even more than femur fracture. So 1.5 to 2 liters of blood is lost in pelvis fracture. Okay. So the biggest concern in pelvis fracture is blood loss which will lead to hemorrhagic shock. But the patient is a polytrauma patient. So you have to follow the algorithm of ATLS. Right. So what is the algorithm? A, B, C, D, E and F. Right. So this blood loss comes at this step. So the first step is to maintain airway. Second step is to make sure the patient is breathing and chest is expanding properly. Need to address pneumothorax and hemothorax and tension pneumothorax. Address all of that. In circulation, what do you need to do? In circulation, you have to stop the bleeding and you have to resuscitate the patient to replace the volume of blood that is lost. Now, the question is interestingly asking you immediate management. So what is the first thing that you should do right now? What would you do? in a patient with pelvis fracture. The first thing to do is to stop any further blood loss. And you can do that with pelvic tamponade to compress the pelvis. You need to understand whenever there is a pelvis fracture, there are two important sources of blood loss. The first and the most important source of blood loss is the venous plexus in the pelvis. When there is a pelvis fracture, this venous plexus gets injured, lacerated, and there is bleeding that happens profusely. Veins are not very muscular like arteries, so they don't undergo spasm. You need to bring them back to place and you increase the pressure around them so that they get compressed and the bleeding stops. How can you attain that? How can you achieve that? By increasing the pressure in the pelvis, by compressing the pelvis or pelvic tamponade. The second source of bleeding that happens in pelvic fractures is the cancellous bones that bleed. So pelvis is mostly a cancellous bone and the bleeding happens because of this cancellous bone, but that is not so much to the extent of venous plexus bleeding. So Pelvic tamponade is what prevents further blood loss. And once you've stopped the blood loss, during that time, you can get the cross matching done and get the appropriate blood for the patient and start that transfusion. So the immediate step that I would prefer to answer is tie a bed sheet around the pelvis because that is the most easy and accessible thing to do. Patient has met with a road traffic accident. He's at the hospital right now. He has come to you before finding the pelvic binder or applying the external fixator in the compression mode. The first thing that you can find is a bed sheet. If you can't find a bed sheet, you can ask for a sheet or a, a, a dupatta or a shawl from your colleagues or someone to use it to save the patient's life, right? So you wrap it around the pelvis and you bring the pelvis together causing pelvic tamponade. Okay, so these are the things that I've just mentioned. Bleeding is a very important cause of death in these patients.
So follow the ATLS protocol with A, B, C, D, E, and in C, you have to stop the bleeding and resuscitate the patient. So apply the pelvic binder for the tamponade effect. You can use a bed sheet, you can use a dupatta, you can use a shawl. Then resuscitate with fluids that are available like a ringer lactate or normal saline. But if blood is available, give blood. And then once the patient is resuscitated, resuscitated then you can shift him to the operation theater and under anesthesia, apply the external fixator in compression mode, not to stabilize the bone, but to bring compression to the pelvis. So this is the image showing you the bed sheet that you can wrap around the pelvis to bring about pelvic tamponade. And this is a pelvic binder that will be available in higher centers, or you can apply the external fixator in compression mode. But please remember, you know, uh, finding the blood to start the transfusion, uh, applying the external fixator in compression mode, all of these things take time. The first thing to do is just wrap, uh, you know, a bed sheet or some shawl around the pelvis to bring about pelvic tamponade. Okay, now look at this question. A 25-year-old man sustained a shoulder injury and presented with a swelling of shoulder. X-ray is shown below, which is our the ligament or ligaments injured. So, acromioclavicular, coracoacromial, coracohumeral, both acromioclavicular and coracoclavicular ligament. So, it's mostly an anatomy MCQ framed as an orthopedic MCQ with an X-ray as an image as a radiology MCQ. So, it's a mixture of all of that. So, this is a very good uh, example of an integrated question. So, you need to know how to read this image and you need to know these structures and you need to associate them with the trauma in orthopedics and understand what can get injured. So, what is this image in front of you? This is an X-ray, right? Which part of the body? Showing you the shoulder, right? So, this is the humerus, this is the clavicle, this is the acromion and this is the coracoid process. Now, what is abnormal in this X-ray? Unless you know what is abnormal, you cannot answer this question, right? You cannot answer this question. So let's look at this. Let's see. I'll tell you the answer. The answer here is both acromioclavicular and coracoclavicular joint, AC and CC joint uh, ligament. Let me show you what this is. So this is a, an image of your shoulder. So the acromion and the clavicle, right? They are usually in the same line. And there is a ligament between the acromion and the clavicular called acromioclavicular ligament. Between there, there is a meniscus also, there is a structure there also, but you don't need to know that, there is a ligament. Now, the coracoid also attaches to the clavicle with coraco, coraco clavicular ligaments, coraco clavicular ligaments. So, coracoid to clavicle, coraco clavicular ligaments and this keeps the clavicle in place. So, there are two coraco clavicular ligaments, the trapezoid and the conoid, conoid because it's in the shape of a cone, conoid keeps the clavicle attached to the coracoid. And acromioclavicular ligament keeps the clavicle attached to the acromion. And this is what keeps the acromioclavicular joint in stability. So, let me show you the x-ray of the same thing. So, here clavicle, acromion in straight line. So, acromioclavicular joint here, acromioclavicular ligament here. Coracoid, coracoclavicular ligament here, the trapezoid and the conoid keeping the clavicle pulled down. Now, if there is an injury around the shoulder and there is injury to the AC ligament, that is acromioclavicular ligament and the coracoclavicular ligament, what do you imagine will happen? The clavicle will be lifted off like this. The clavicle will be lifted off like this as in the image here. So, you have to understand what is normal. The abnormality here is that the acromion and the clavicle are not in the same level anymore. So, the clavicle has moved up higher. So, there is a gap. There is a gap and there is an exaggerated gap between the coracoid and the clavicle, suggesting what? Both injury to the acromioclavicular ligament and coracoclavicular ligament, making the clavicle a free structure, right? And this is what happens. When there is an injury, the clavicle lifts up like this. Why does it lift up like this? Because of the insertion or the attachment of the sternocleidomastoid that pulls the clavicle up. When the clavicle is pulled up by the sternocleidomastoid, there is this step that happens there. Some people call it a step sign. It's just that the clavicle is getting lifted up. So, if there is only an in rupture of the acromioclavicular ligament, what will happen? The gap between the acromion and the clavicle would increase, but the clavicle would still remain down, right? It would still remain at the same place. But if the AC ligament as well as the CC ligament are injured, then the clavicle would be lifted up like that. And that is what the examiner was asking you. So it is both the AC 
and the CC ligament that are injured that causes this. It's not a very common injury. This question had never been asked previously, but now you know. But now you know. If you knew your anatomy, you would have been able to answer this. Okay. Now, please do not get confused with clavicle fracture that is frequently asked on your exam. So again, look at this image here. This is an X-ray of the shoulder, and you can clearly see that there is a fracture in the shaft of the clavicle, not around acromioclavicular joint. So acromion and clavicle are still maintained in the same line. So acromioclavicular ligament is intact, and coracoclavicular ligament the trapezoid and the conoid are still attached that's why the gap between the coracoid and the clavicle is still the same there is a fracture here at the clavicle in the middle of the clavicle so a sternocleidomastoid will pull the medial fragment up and the lateral fragment goes down because of the weight of the arm and that is what is happening here okay so there is no need to get confused clavicle fracture is an obvious clavicle fracture this is not clavicle fracture in fact this is an ac joint disruption because of AC ligament injury and CC ligament injury. Okay, so this was a new one. Now, this was a new one, and this might have been a little difficult for you, but nevertheless, if you knew your anatomy, you would have been able to answer this. Okay, so my friends, the point of this session was to help you understand that although the questions were asked from the previous year topics, but it was not so simple and straightforward. The options were tricky. They were trying to understand whether you have thoroughly understood this or not. So just going by practicing the previous year question is not enough or sufficient to crack an asset exam. You should know what those topics are. And once you know those topics, try to thoroughly understand them so that if they play uh, you know, a, a, a difficult game or ball with that topic, you should be in a place to answer that. Now, if you have any concerns or are not happy with explanations, you can ask me in the comment section or you know you can find me on Instagram where you can directly DM me to help you with orthopedics or your uh, preparation strategy. I wish you all the best and I will see you on the other side. Bye-bye.